The sports car company Porsche has announced its IPO in Q4 of 2022. So this means at the end of September already they will be a publicly listed company. And in this video we will go through several parts. And I have made some notes here. So first of all we will start with the background and motivation of this IPO. Why does Porsche want to go public right now? And also what is the role of the mother company Volkswagen? Why do they want to spin off Porsche? Then in the second part, we will analyze how you can own Porsche already today indirectly through public stocks. And also we will look how did those stocks perform historically. Then the third part will be key facts of the Porsche IPO. In one slide, you will see all the fundamentals and the data behind the, on the facts on the Porsche IPO. Then we will go into the details in the fourth part. Then we will dive into the prospectus and the presentation of Porsche. And what is their strategy? What are the fundamentals of Porsche? And we want to assess, is this company a high quality company or a low quality company? Is it worth owning for us investors? That company, this is the first thing before we look at the price. And then the best comes really at the end. We will look at a comparison of Porsche versus Ferrari and also Tesla regarding fundamentals and valuation and also the stock performance. Okay. And this will give us more insights if it's worth investing in Porsche or not. And finally, I will give you my assessment if Porsche is fairly priced on my analysis or not and is it worth investing in and what are some strategies that you can use for IPO investing no matter if it's Porsche or any other type of stock. So make sure you stick until the end of the video it will be action packed. Before we dive into the content please check out my free investing course Investing Unlocked. There's a link in the video description below and it will bring you directly to the first video. Now let's start. So first about the background and motivation of the Porsche IPO. On this slide you can see the structure currently and also the new spin-off structure. So at the top you have the Porsche holding company. This is just an investment company and it holds different companies or assets like for example a stake in Volkswagen. This is a car company and not only Volkswagen the brand but it includes Porsche stakes. It includes um, um, Lamborghini stakes and so on. Okay, so there are a lot of different companies, including Audi and so on, in that Volkswagen brand. Okay, and the Porsche holding is just an investment holding company, it's nothing to do with the car production, it's just an investment company. Okay, and they hold 31% of Volkswagen, have 53% voting rights, and they also hold 12.5% in Porsche. Um, directly and Volkswagen owns 75% of Porsche in the new spin-off structure and Porsche the idea here is at the very bottom of this slide the Porsche block is basically the car company okay this is the asset which is currently inside the Volkswagen inside the blue block and now the idea of the IPO of the spin-off IPO is to spin off the car manufacturer Porsche out of the Volkswagen brand basically so they can be a standalone company and act more independently and more efficiently and also to realize the value creation of Porsche of a high quality sports car company with high margins and so on uh, by listing it on the public markets through an IPO okay and the public markets they will have the opportunity to buy up to 12.5% of Porsche okay so you see there's a, this is the structure, the spin-off structure that we have right here. Okay. So if we look now in the second part at also what are already the public companies that you can own today, where you can have an ownership in Porsche, maybe not directly and not in a pure play, but in an impure or indirect play. Okay. And the first way to do this is through Volkswagen. This company is public listed and obviously they have a stake in Porsche, the company. So it's part of the Volkswagen basically group. And you can see here the price performance of Volkswagen stock. And obviously there's a long-term uptrend. Okay. And this is the first thing, but this is, if you look just at the last, let's say 10, 10 years, 
it's basically going sideways. Okay, of course you have ups and downs, there's opportunity to trade and create profits, of course, but still there's not huge momentum behind it. And also the valuation, total valuation, market capitalization of Volkswagen equity is basically relatively low compared to really US tech companies, which are quite popular, for example, such as Tesla. Okay, so there's a huge valuation gap. Okay, so Volkswagen cannot or has the market has not recognized Volkswagen stock um, with a, uh, let's say, high quality, high momentum company that deserves uh, increasing stock price and higher valuations. Okay, but for Tesla, the market has recognized it and we will analyze why. Now, the second way how you can basically hold indirectly a stake in Porsche, the sports car manufacturer, is through Porsche Holding, this is just a holding company, and here you have a similar picture because Porsche Holding also has a, um, stakes in Volkswagen and other assets as well. Okay, and Porsche, the sports car company, is just one of the, those assets they hold. And here you see also a sideways movement. Okay, there's of course opportunity to make profits, of course, in a range, but still, it's, it's not like a super attractive long term investment that produces really superior investing returns right now at least okay so this is the first observation yes you can already get a stake through public markets in porsche but indirectly and not pure play and the performance is so far not so great okay now let's look at the key facts of the porsche ipo the expected ipo price is around 80 euro okay they have outstanding shares of 911 million but they will only issue a certain part 140 million to for the floating shares okay to the public and the market cap of the company if this ipo share price is really realized is 73 billion euro and the first trading day on the um uh, 29th of september basically is the first trading day on the frankfurt stock exchange so 12.5 percent of shares are issued for the trading on the frankfurt stock exchange okay now the total assets we have 51 billion euro in total assets the liabilities are 28 billion and this leaves us with the equity it's just a difference between assets and liabilities of 23 billion now if we look at the revenue they produce sales of 33 billion euro okay quite a lot and earnings before interest taxes depreciation amortization is 7.4 billion now if we look at if we include the effects of interest depreciation amortization they have an operating profit out of those sales of 33 billion of 5.3 billion euro this is the operating profit and if we deduct taxes from that it leaves porsche with an after-tax profit of 4 billion euro okay this is huge huge amounts of money and a net cash flow of 3.7 billion so they produce they are very profitable because in the high high luxury segment you have a uh, much much higher margins and this makes you much more profitable than a normal car company okay this is just the gist of it and um, if we look at some valuation multiples like price sales for example uh, with that ipo share price of 80 euro and the market cap of 73 billion compared to the sales or revenue of 33 billion euro it leaves us with a price to sales ratio of 2.2 and uh, if we look at the book value of the equity, which is basically the 23 billion, then we have a multiple of market cap to total equity book value of 3.2. Okay, so both price to sales and price to books actually, it's maybe not super cheap, but it is also not really high. So, from my understanding, this is already shows me the IPO pricing seems to be fair okay it's, it's not totally outrageous it's also not super undervalued but it seems appropriate for that type of company okay and now if we look at the price earnings so the after-tax profit of 4 billion then we have a price to earnings ratio um, of basically 18x okay that's the multiple so 18x is a little bit high but also it's roughly market uh, market average okay and obviously it would be much nicer to get a multiple of 10 or something like that for such a company and it might happen because after the ipo the share price will fluctuate maybe there's an opportunity 
to pick up some shares at a little bit lower valuation, but this is the, the first glance, okay? And it shows already that this is a company that has a lot of assets, valuable assets. They don't have too much debt. They have high sales, good sales, and they have high margins, okay? And they make a lot of profit. And the valuation seems to be fair. This is the first assessment that we have here. Now let's go to the prospectus and the presentation of Porsche where they outline their strategy and also their fundamentals. And we want to assess, is this company high quality or not? Is it even worth investing? No matter what the price is, is the asset good? Is the, is the, is the share good? And here they outline a lot of numbers, okay? And we I will just briefly highlight some of them. You see that have a group revenue, um, growth rate, so Kager is the compound annual growth rate, okay? This is just uh, how quickly your revenue grows year over year. And that number is 9%, so this is quite high. Each year, they increase their sales by 9%. This is what it means, okay? And um, they have a good return on sales, so the operating profit compared to their sales is 60%, double digits, big double digits. They have positive cash flow of 3.7 billion. I mean, that's a lot of money, okay? and uh, you can reinvest that and so on. And their return on investment is 21%. Their EBITDA margin is 24%. So all of those numbers is a different way to look at things. But the important thing to understand here is it's double digits um, and high, relatively high double digits. And this is a, a good profit margins here, okay? And also sales growth. So it's not like their business is staying the same. It's growing, it's getting bigger and they're earning a lot more money. So even if their, their um, let's say, margin, uh, profit margin stay the same, if just the sales increase, they will still earn more and more money, okay? So now here is a list of their vehicles, okay? And as you can see, of course, a lot of you know, they produce the sports cars, okay? 911, 718, and so on. But they have also new models, which go more in the mainstream market, like limousines, like the Panamera, or also SUV vehicles, like the Cayenne. And the Macan is really low priced, so it's not only purely luxury sports cars, but also really going a little bit more mainstream, maybe a bit above the premium segment. Okay, so it's quite a big audience they address here. It's 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 not so niche, and the global presence of them is, as you can see here, they are worldwide operating. Okay, in North America, Europe, China, and the rest of the world. So it's they don't have a dependency on just one single market, which is, I think, a good thing. Here they argue in their presentation that their market is growing, which means the high net worth individuals market is growing by 9%. That's what they argue. At least SUV segment is growing by 6% per year. So they see demand from the SUVs. They see also demand in the BEV, the battery electric vehicles. It's just an electric vehicle, okay? purely electric vehicle without any combustion engine of 34%, obviously because of the regulation and so on, you know what I mean? You, you need to reduce your car emissions and so on. It's basically a regular, re regulatory requirement and that's why they have to push for it, okay? Now, this is one example of their battery electric vehicle. It's a Taycan, okay? They argue here, it's a quite a good car. Now, what else? So here they outline the strategy of their BEV, strategy and in the next years you see the share of BEVs in the whole fleet will grow much much higher. So obviously 80% in 2030 that's at least the, the strategy here just to let you know but this is a um, similar topic in the whole automotive industry okay. Now what about the group revenue you can see here 2017 to 2021 the revenue grew from 23 billion to 33 billion that's basically a um, growth rate of 9% per year, which is quite nice, quite high. And also a stable growth. If we look at the profit margins, it's around 16% in average and the, the profits are also growing every year. Um, and here from 4.1 to 5.3, this is maybe 6% growth of profits per year. Now, what about their net cash flow? Here you can see that they generate an increase net cash flow, positive cash flow, year by year, basically. And this also shows quite uh, a nice trend. Then they have shown here, basically, that 
they have a good track record of successful model launches. Okay, so here you see the model launches from 2011 to 2022. Now obviously, if they introduce a new model like the Panamera, the Cayenne, or here the Macan and the Taycan, you see that the number of the deliveries of delivered vehicles goes rapidly up and this speaks for a successful new model launch. Okay, that's what they argue here. Now with the pricing, how the cars priced, you see here the 911, the top model sports car, it's a big range, but up to 280k uh, in Euro. And you have some lower priced models like the Macan 66 to 91k per vehicle, depending on the options you order. Okay, just a rough idea that it's not only pure high luxury sports cars, it's also a little bit ma mainstream and vehicles that can be afforded by, uh, let's say, uh, not only the very top earners. Then they argue here that they have a lean cost structure. This means although they increase their revenue, although they increase their profits, they say their basically expenses stay roughly the same. And they say they have a lean cost structure, which is a good thing. I mean, it's definitely impressive. Then here, this is more maybe on the negative side. One thing they highlight in their report is the pension provisions. Okay, they, they have here obligations of pensions of 5 billion and um, they need to obviously reduce those obligations or provide the capital for those pension obligations over time. And you see here the 5.4 billion that did not really decrease that much over 2019 to 2021. And, uh, this is something to keep in mind. It's not a big issue, I think, but still it's a significant amount of capital. I think they can easily manage this, but still something to be aware of. Then the net liquidity development, you see here that basically it just shows do they have enough cash or liquidity, okay? Or cash-like liquidity. And here you see in 2021, the right side, it's basically they have 3.4 in borrowings or loans. This is a negative, but on the other side, they have a lot of cash to service the debt. You know what I mean? They have 4.6 billion in pure cash and also they have securities of 3.8 billion in net. This leaves you with 5 billion of net liquidity. So it's a positive thing and it's quite, I think, healthy. Then here is also maybe a bit on the negative side, something to be aware of post IPO because you have some one-time effects directly after the IPO, just in this year or at the end of this year and uh, also maybe in the first quarter of next year okay this is some some things they say here that of course they have a starting net liquidity in 2021 this is the left side then they have of course expected net cash that they generate but they have also a lot of cost through the ipo okay and this is a negative and but they get some cash injection by vw um so they end up with some positive net liquidity, okay, by the end of this year. And then they say there's a DPLTA payout, okay? And what is a DPLTA payout? And you have to look in the fine print, planned termination of domination and profit and loss transfer agreement, okay? And you have to be aware that there's also some agreements of, of payouts, of profits and so on, you know what I mean? And this seems to be a negative. And you see already here, they don't quantify it, but it looks like the net liquidity decreases actually with this effect, whatever it is in the details. I don't even care right now because this is just a first quick analysis. It seems to be a net negative and also be aware that this can be a negative also in the share price after IPO, even if it's pushed a little bit high now and there's a significant interest, uh, make sure you watch and observe also the price because there can be maybe a, a, a little bit dip doesn't have to happen, but it's a potential. And this could be an argument for that. Okay. Just to keep it in mind. Then the financial outlook, the key performance indicators. Okay. We talked about this revenue and they have here plans, the midterm targets on the right hand side. They want to grow their revenue. They want to uh, have a, a target for their um, return on sales of 70 to 19%. They want to keep their profit margins in the range of 25 to 27% and net cash flow 12 to 14%, okay? Long-term ambition, 12 plus, 20% plus group um, return on sales. Okay, so this is basically the picture, okay? And then also they have some capital allocation policies, okay? They want to invest in R&D and so on. They have some ventures, they have some pensions, okay? They, they express here the, the negative, they need to fund those pensions in the midterm, whatever midterm means, and the liquidity is strong, they argue, and they want to 
at least in the midterm, pay out 50% of their earnings as a dividend. Okay, this is for the investors. Uh, uh, interesting point. Now, there are a lot of things with the governance and some, some things because you see uh, Porsche is spin off out of Volkswagen. Okay, but still Porsche wants to use the scale effects of the mother brand you know, because it's, it will be much more efficient for them and um, it would lead to better profits if they can keep this advantage. But on the other hand, and they want to act as independently as possible to fully realize the full Porsche value creation. But on the other hand, there still seems to be entanglement with the brand. So they cannot just, you know, exit out completely. So there is some, some governance issues, some conflicts of interest. And on those slides, you can read this by yourself. I will not go, go into the details of this. They argue here, okay, about the synergies, about the advantages, but also it highlights a little bit of the disadvantages. And just to keep in mind, there's also some, I think, negatives behind that and some potential risks behind all of that. Okay. And, um, but at the end of the day, it's a net a positive, I would argue. And they have a supervisory board. And uh, here you see also the Volkswagen involvement is still there. Okay, so um, it's not like they're just completely gone from the Volkswagen side. Okay, now here they show also some income statement of the Porsche Group. Okay, and in 2021, we see here again the revenue 33 billion. Then, of course, they produce a lot of um, cost for the sales, for the production of the cars, and so on. They end up with a gross profit of 8.8 .8 billion. Then they have, of course, expenses for employees, for distribution, and so on. They end up then with 5.3 billion of operating profit. And then if you deduct some, let's say, interest expenses and so on, you end up with profit before tax of 5.7 billion. And deducting the tax expenses gives you the 4 billion of profit after tax. Then if we look at the, and the, net cash flow this is the the cash flow uh, statement then they have on the 2021 side here the starting net liquidity of 3 billion then they have an operating profit of 5 billion um, that comes there and if we include or consider the depreciation depreciation and amortization they have an ebitda of 7.4 billion and then if you basically want to find out from the earnings to get to the uh, the pure cash flow it gets you to 3.7 billion if you consider all the things here in the middle which are basically cash or non-cash items that are added or deducted accordingly and basically this is a resulting uh, total change in the net liquidity of 2.2 billion okay this is pretty much it and this leaves you then at the end of the year with the um net liquidity of 5 billion okay if you then look at now the balance sheet here okay this is just the asset side and on the right hand side you see again 2021 they have non-current assets of 32 billion 18 billion of current assets so 51 billion of assets on the liability side they have total liabilities of 28 billion that leaves you then with equity of 23 billion roundabout 